When fighting broke out in Sudan in April, Europe appeared to be caught by surprise. Not only were the EU and Britain powerless to prevent Sudan descending into violence, even the effort to evacuate European citizens turned into a scramble. So, should Europe have been able to do better? Welcome to the program, I'm Philip Hampshire. The rivalry between Sudan's two most powerful generals is nothing new. They've shared an uneasy power since overthrowing the regime of Omar al-Bashir in 2019. However, international powers appeared to have been willing to hedge their bets and support both in order to retain influence in the country. But now Europe has had to get its citizens out and almost no Western diplomats have been left behind. Fighting in the East African state Sudan began April 15, 2023, between two rival generals. General Abdul Fattah al-Burhan, commander of the Sudan Armed Forces, and General Mohamed Hamdan Dagalo, commander of the paramilitary group the Rapid Support Forces. The violence intensified despite the warring sides agreeing on a US-mediated ceasefire. The European Union and its member states strongly condemned the ongoing fighting. Yes, I've been talking with all the neighbors, all friends, even with the two generals in commanding the, the forces. And the international humanity message is the, is the same. You have to stop the war, silence the guns, and start talking and looking for a political solution. The two generals have shared power since ousting former Sudanese president Omar al-Bashir in a coup in 2019. Al-Burhan was sworn in as Sudan's de facto ruler and Dagalo as his deputy leader. But after things fell apart, analysts now fear a civil war is inevitable. So can Sudan find peace soon and should the international community have done more? So let's discuss the situation in Sudan. Joining me in the studio, I have Professor Alam Ahmed, who is founder of Sudan Knowledge and director of the Middle Eastern Knowledge Institute. Meanwhile, in London, we have the author of Talking About a Revolution, Yasmin Abdel Majid, and in Cairo, Matt Nashed, who is a journalist covering the Middle East and North Africa with a special focus on Sudan. Thank you for joining me, everyone. Um, Alam, if I start off with you, is Europe doing enough? with regards to Sudan. Indeed, is this anything to do with Europe or should Europe mind its own business here? Thank you very much. Uh, Europe is not doing enough since the revolution, four or five years now, uh, from two aspects. The first one, quantitatively and qualitatively. In terms of qualitatively, most European countries, including the UK here, they want to be seen as doing enough. So it's more of like tick box, we have done this. We have tried to do this. But in terms of physically or uh, actually on the ground, they, the way they have been working with Sudan since the revolution is more of trying to, what, is, what, I'm, what I have there or what I'm going to get from this Sudan is whatever the French, the British, the American, everyone got his take there, but not in real partnership. What is being missing, that's why I said it's not enough. They didn't really work with the Sudanese people in terms of partnership, more of benefits and the benefit of the country where they are trying to operate from. So that's why I don't think they have done enough. In the recent crisis, this last two, uh, 15 days, I think some have done a little bit faster and quicker, like Germany, France. Uh, our government, unfortunately, has been appallingly slow, appallingly, it's been criticized by everyone, even MBs in the government, is the parliament, the Sudanese people, the suffering, they still continue. They haven't done enough in this recent one. Yasmin, would you agree with that? Yes, I would. And I think it's interesting to, to consider what Europe's role is in Sudan generally. So, you know, as Professor Alam just sort of spoke about, in, in the current crisis, obviously, we can think about how European countries have supported not only the evacuations, um, and some have been better than others, obviously, but also the ways in which um, European nations treated Sudanese people who, for example, you know, applied for visas and had their passports sitting in their embassies um, and, and haven't been able to help people retrieve their passports or haven't given them any sort of documentation for them to leave the country. So, so at a sort of granular individual level, I think U European countries have generally been like, we'll, we'll try to get our citizens out if that, um, and we'll, we'll let people do their own thing, really. We'll, uh, even the humanitarian aid 
deployments. And yes, it's been difficult because there haven't been safe routes. And that's been something that many international government organizations have spoken to. But generally, the response has been very slow and very sluggish. So yes, that at the individual crisis level. But generally, when we think about Europe's role in relation to Sudan, I think it's really important to, to look at the role that Europe played in the negotiations over the last few years. Well, the Sudanese people, the civilians, pushed for a civilian government, and they pushed against any, you know, quote-unquote pragmatic deal with the generals in question. And yet, European leaders generally, supported by, you know, other, um, the, the United Nations, the US, etc., felt like, oh, it would be more appropriate for us to deal with the generals in good faith rather than listen to the Sudanese people that have lived under um, you know, the, the military for, for decades now. And I think that is a direct result that has led to where we are today. Totally understandable that you would say that. If you're in the position of the European governments, though, who do you talk to on the civilian side of things? The current civil war is, if you like, a breakdown between two generals, neither of which are supported by the civilian population. So it's not like there's a good guy and there's a bad guy here. It, it's uh, two groups who are ideologically relatively similar, simply fighting over power. Who could the Europeans have talked to? It's a very fair question, and I think you're absolutely right to ask, you know, who... And this is perhaps the... That's why European diplomats and so on went to the generals, because they're the, the obvious people to speak to. But, for example, you have a civilian front to stop the war and end democracy and to end the war um, and, and find democracy or, or secure democracy, as it were, uh, a, a front that has l hundreds of you know, women's groups and unions and resistance committees that have all gotten together and put a very clear list and statement of what they want to happen. And so those people are reachable. They've signed with their own names. And so if European leaders were really serious about dealing with civilians and dealing with the actual community and civil society, I think they would be able to do, to, to find those people to speak to. I think it's just maybe slightly, maybe there's a little bit more friction, but that doesn't mean that it isn't the right thing to do. Matt, what's your position? Do you think the European leaders and the European Union, indeed, have done enough to help the people of Sudan? Um, no, uh, but I also think that um, when we're speaking about the European Union, um, you know, and, and to maybe um, echo Yasmin's point here, we can't divorce their efforts, I think, from broader um, regional initiatives that included regional states and Western states like the Quad that included the UK or uh, the broader European Union position, which was to back uh, UNITAMS, which is the UN mission in Sudan and their mediation efforts. Um, I think on a political level, if we're going to, um, you know, look back before um, the armed conflict erupted and, and particularly after the October 2021 military coup, um, I, I think we can see that uh, there's two stories here. I think one, which has already been echoed by their guests here, in which um, there was a failure to imagine a different way of doing politics. And as a result of that, rather than invest in more process-driven uh, politics, issue-driven politics, and, and engage with new civilian structures on the ground, which would have been messier, taken a longer political process, but it would have contributed to a new consensus, they gravitated to existing personalities, including civilian, regardless of the legitimacy that they had from the street. So I think that's one level. The other level, very quickly, is um, even when they were doing politics in the orthodox that they know how to do politics, I don't think they were doing it very well. I don't even think they were playing their own game so great. Uh, I think they were all very ill-coordinated. Uh, Unitems uh, was doing their thing supported by the EU. The Quad had its own pressure and was doing its thing. And then you had statements coming out from the Troika and Washington on all three different levels would give you a different statement over the last 12 months. So the coordination raised a lot of alarms in terms of not only just maybe who should, you know, the Europeans or the global community speak, be speaking to in Sudan, but I think the vice versa is true. Who should the pro-democracy movement be speaking to in the global community? because they were all over the place. And that made it very difficult to know who's really on their side and, and, and using leverage accordingly. 
um, on the on behalf of the same goals of the pro-democracy movement, if that existed. Now, Ahmed, uh, no, Matt raises a really good point there, um, which is the difficulty that uh, the leaders within Sudan have had, civilian leaders within Sudan have had, of trying to find a pinpoint person to talk to within the European Union and vice versa. So how can we compare and contrast this with, say, the, situa the situation in Ukraine, where immediately there was one line in the West, the United States uh, led the charge, said, no, the Ukrainians are on the side of right, the Russians are on the side of wrong, we're going to take charge here. Britain then lines up behind the US view. Anybody who was a straggler, Germany, France, if you like, get browbeaten or pressured into following along that line, we haven't seen any of that with Sudan, have we? Yes, uh, I, I was, uh, have been saying this for the last week, that comparing Ukraine crisis with the Sudan crisis is very different because... In the case of Ukraine, I mean, I lived here 30 years in the UK. I'm a British Sudanese uh, national. I have seen the way the politics is played in this Western part of the world. Uh, it's all about what do I have there? What is my interest? So the interest of the whole West led by the United States is to cobble down the Russian uh, empire by all means. That's what we all know since, since 20 or 25 years ago. So anything involved Russia is always treated very harshly. And don't forget that word of uh, Liz Truss when she said we want to bring uh, Putin into his knees. It's a very, very ugly wording said. And it's been repeated by the foreign minister of, of, of Russia. So even you can see the rhetoric, the tone is very tough. Uh, our prime minister traveled there at the time. So the situation is very different. So because we do have lots of interest in that war. That's number one. We do have lots of interest to finish Putin if possible in that war. We're looking for any way to really finish this Russia from all its attack on Europe and the Western one. Number three, I think, and if this is being said, although politely, but I, I call it discrimination in a way, because many people, I know it came out sometimes, but the way they, the, 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 the Europeans, they see uh, Ukrainian is different than the way they see Sudan or any African nation. Uh, from ethnicity background, from race, from religions, and some of them actually caught on uh, unrecorded uh, public appearance, saying that the Ukrainians, in defense of how we have generously supported and came out to welcome the Ukrainian, and actually citizens of this country have been fighting the government of doing more towards the Ukrainian. Okay, we want to welcome them in the houses. Where are they? Because they said they can easily be embedded in our culture, because the cultural value between them, I understand that between the Ukrainian is very much fit with the fabric of this country, or with the Western in general. And also, don't forget that many of the immigrants to the United States are actually from Ukraine. I know one of our top professor, guru in marketing, Philip Kotler, is a big name worldwide, is originally migrated from Ukraine. So they got lots of influence internationally. And sadly, I think uh, the issue of the energy, and you have seen this, not in the UK, Today, we have a report from BB recording 4 billion pounds profit over the last three months, primarily because of the prices of the energy. So there's many things happening here. When you compare this to Sudan, none of this exists unless you have the human and moral obligations toward that country. And that's what I said earlier in my discussion. Europeans are more of want to be seen are doing what they should be doing. Like uh, Suela Brio, every time she's been asked why are you treating these people? We have doctors strangled in Khartoum. They want to come here. They're working here. I was following a story of Dr. Abdurrahman today in the BBC, who been flown from, from Manchester. He was, he said to them at the, at the, air, at the, at the, at the military air, airfield, said to them, I am not a British citizen, but I am a Sudanese working in the UK. I work there during the difficult COVID time. Are you now telling me I cannot travel back to serve your country? So there's so many of this one. So it's, it's, it's a very complicated uh, two scenarios to compare them, I think. Yasmin, what do you make of the uh, sort of, if you like, different treatment between Ukraine and Sudan? Yeah, well, to echo a lot of what the professor said there, I think obviously there is, you know, the... Well, number one, I guess the obvious thing is that with, with the situation in Ukraine, there was a very straightforward and easy, you know, 
story around who the enemy was, story around what right and wrong looked like, and story around what winning looked like. And I think, unfortunately, for Sudanese people, the context, um, you know, putting aside um, the, the sort of European story about Ukraine being sort of closer to Europe, culturally and so on, and all of the racialized overtones and so on, like in that story, but simply when when you sort of frame it in the um, West versus Russia narrative, that's something that is very easy. It's a, it's an easy sell, as it were. In addition to the conversation around energy and gas, and knowing that it was really going to impact n regular Europeans at the hip pocket. Um, so so unfortunately, because that direct connection um, from you know the the energy situation isn't there, and also you don't have such an easy story about what winning looks like. I think it has become very difficult for um, for politicians to sort of sell the story. And this is me giving everyone the benefit of the doubt. This is me sort of treating everyone in good faith. Unfortunately, the situation in Sudan um, is such that the easy story of who is right and who is wrong, and the easy story of if we got involved, what would winning look like? Doesn't present itself, and so in order to communicate, you know, what Europe's role is for your average politician, um, they have to do a lot more work. And in addition, and speaking to the the conversation around migrants, let's be quite honest here: the migrants that the European Union is stopping at its borders, the migrants that are dying in the Channel, many of them are already Sudanese people. The European Union paid Sudan, and a lot of that money is said to have ended up with Hemeti and the RSL, you know, in, in 2019 and earlier through, um, related to something called the Khartoum process, paid like hundreds of millions essentially of euros to prevent migrants reaching the borders of the African continent and entering the waters, right? So we're already looking at a European nation or a European bloc that is hostile to migrants from Sudan and from the Sahel and so on. And so, you know, you're not looking at a context where people are saying, let's open the doors. You're not seeing Britain set up the same kind of family visa schemes for Sudanese people as they did for the Ukrainians. Unfortunately, we're in a completely different and, and tragic um, situation, I think. Matt, I'm going to take this across you. Let's assume for the moment that the European Union did somehow magically will wave a magic wand. They decide to get the political impetus to go in there and intervene in Sudan. They can't, can they? Because there are two sides. Both sides have 100,000 soldiers each. And um, but where's the European Union going to pull 200,000 soldiers from and stick them in between the two forces? They're already sending all the materiel and all the tanks and all the spare armaments that they have because they're dealing with the Ukrainian problem. Is there space, if you like, mental capacity space, processing power for the system to deal with an extra issue in Sudan? I mean, uh, we're, I mean, we're not giving Europeans a lot of credit if they're not able to do that. And if they're not able to, then okay, then we won't give them credit anymore. I mean, maybe we're just expecting too much from them. Um, personally, uh, you know, I, I do, uh, I, would, I would qualify my statement by saying I don't think any kind of military or, or weapons intervention into Sudan is, is um, uh, that shouldn't be the conversation at all. I, I never heard it being the conversation before. That's not what any actor should be doing. Um, I think- What, what would you like to see the conversation being then? Humanitarian aid? Um, well, I think we should identify um, the actors that are, uh, that do have sway with the, with the belligerents on the ground, uh, which would be mostly regional Arab states. Um, and then I think we should understand that of these regional Arab states, they are partners of Western states. They are partners of Europe. They're partners of the U.S. Um, and, uh, and so there could be some unified leverage there if the European Union and maybe perhaps the U.K. in this case decided to act like a union. Uh, and it goes back to coordinated efforts in order to put leverage on um, their partners accordingly. But to put it just quite uh, bluntly, this isn't a matter of whether or not they have the capacity in order to think of two issues at the same time. This is a matter of simply of, of, you know, maybe it's controversial, but I don't think it is, just blatant racism. They care about Ukraine, they don't care about Sudan. And they only care about Sudan as much as it impacts other regional files, such as Yasmin brought up migration, 
such as perhaps Wagner and, and the emergence of them. That's where the conversation very much centered within, uh, within um, you know, Western discourse so far. Let me uh, bring up a, gra uh, a graphic that we have here that shows a uh, map that we have of Sudan indicating where some of the uh, conflicts have been taking place. And um, in the Al Fashaga region, which is a disputed border region between Sudan and Ethiopia, actually not far away from the Tigray province in Ethiopia. Ethiopia, of course, still reeling a little bit from the Tigray war. There is the potential, because of that conflict that's currently taking place in this disputed region, that this conflict could spread from Sudan across into Ethiopia. One of the sides in Sudan has already asked Eritrea if they could send in soldiers to help them. You've mentioned yourself Wagner Group, the Russian mercenary group. We had the uh, Russian prime minister just the other day say, if Sudan wants to avail itself of the Wagner Group mercenaries, we've already seen Wagner Group mercenaries in the Central African Republic. We've seen them go into Mali. Yeah, sure, why not into Sudan as well? So at that point, the internationalization of the conflict does happen. Do you think that's the point at which Europe starts to care? Uh... Yes, I mean perhaps. I mean, I, I, I don't. I think the uh, internationalization of the conflict is already there. I think the point that I'm driving home is that it can't just be considered the internationalization of a conflict when actors not directly affiliated with um, Western partners start to get involved. Just because Wagner gets involved, that doesn't mean it's internationalized, right? I know that's not what you're saying. But I think that's what we're kind of alluding to with how much Europe and, and Western reaction um, would be if they started to, to highlight that as being the case. Matt, thank you for that. Yasmin, let me bring you in there because you were nodding. Yeah, I was just thinking as Matt was talking that what sometimes I think um, European nations don't understand is that, or maybe, or maybe it's something that they prefer not to think about, is that the easy, quick solution is not going to be the long-term solution. And that was the mistake that was made you know, in 2019 um, and that led to the coup in 2021 and so on. It's that if, if you want just a Band-Aid solution, then you're going to see this stretch out. Then you're essentially, you know, in this case, maybe maybe the RSF, maybe the militia lose Khartoum um, and then it gets pushed out. Uh, the conflict continues more in Darfur, more in maybe El Fashir. Like, it doesn't, the conflict doesn't go away because the actors are not necessarily going away. And so unless there is, as Matt was talking about, a complete... Um, restructure and an investment. And, you know, Professor Alam also talked about if, if there was partnership taken seriously, if peop if the Europeans looked at Sudan as an equal partner, not as, you know, in the colonial construct of, you know, just the nation that needs aid, but as a serious partner, then really the best solution is a country that is fulfilled. I mean, Sudan is incredibly rich in resources and people. And so, so it's not as if it's not a nation that can stand up on its own two feet, but it has been hobbled time and time and time again. So the real long-term sustainable solution would have been an investment and may inshallah be an investment in you know, a, a truly um, robust, sophisticated civilian governance. But that requires, as Matt sort of mentioned, maybe a messier process, maybe something that people are a bit uncomfortable with, but unless it's that is taken seriously, right. it, we're going to see a repetition of what we already have. Alam, let me just quickly bring you in again. Um, part of the problem here is that Europe's just left Sudan alone too long, hasn't it? I mean, since 1999, when this whole thing kicked off, there have been two coups since 2019, all sorts of problems over the last 30 years, and nobody's really done anything, whether it's Darfur, whether it's any other time. Is that the way it is? It is. And I think uh, the way they have left the Darfurian people uh, is abhorring. Uh, we, even the Sudanese, feel that we have also didn't do enough to support our own people in Darfur. And that's one of the big problems, by the way, here. The Sudanese people are not united. And that's the exact wording of the British envoy, to the, the British government envoy to the Sudan. I was here three months ago in a, in a meeting with all political parties. Bob said to them, you need to unite to avoid the military coming again. He said that here in London. So the Sudanese people also need to be blamed for not uniting around each other, 
There's a loss of suspicion. Some of them accusing the other part of discrimination. And this is quite wide. I have to be very honest here. But secondly, yes, the European did not do enough like they have done with other countries. The second thing they didn't do enough, they have always been very cozy with these military people. Just look at one example. While the military is killing our people, young generations, on the street of Khartoum, General Burhan was very much welcomed here to attend the funeral of the queen. He was welcomed in New York, a killer. He's been labeled as a killer, for example, not me. Everywhere is labeling him. How come you invited him to come here? The Sudanese people confronted the Bob, the envoy, and said to him, you have to, you can't have two direction of, let us understand, are you with us or with the military? Number three, uh, Hameti, the, the, the other part. He traveled, he met Putin, he met, uh, he traveled everywhere. He's been met by presidents, red carpet for him. Who is doing all this? Who is facilitating that? Who is making it possible? It's the Western society. Alan, thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure. pleasure to have you in. Uh, Yasmin, Matt, thank you very much for joining me as well. It's been excellent discussing this with you. I'm afraid, though, that that is all we have time for on today's programme. If you want to see more discussion and debate, just head on over to our YouTube channel and search for Roundtable TRT World. For now, from me here and all of the team, thank you for watching and goodbye. <laughs>